Camera Astronomy. As a co-member of the science team of the Content Gamma Observatory, he pursued his research in the area of extracollective diffuse gamma emission at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for a decade. In 1999, he returned to India and headed the Space Astronomy Group at the ISRO Satellite Center. And uh, in 2013, he uh, came to I as a director uh, for a five-year period at uh, July 2018. And then he returned to ISRO as head of the Space Science Program Office at ISRO headquarters. So uh, Dr. Srikumar's research work includes cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays, um, UV astronomy. He has contributed to the design and development of space fields on Chandrayaan SPI, Chandrayaan 1 SPI, and the SCOPI. His current interest is on development of multilayer of mirrors for X-ray planetary studies. And recently, he has done a lot of work, probably expanded to other areas uh, of uh, the galaxy interaction, etc. Akanti Srikumar is a uh, Sadish Dhawan professor at ISRO. And uh, once again, today's topic is Indian Space Astronomy and Planetary Exploration Programs. Thank you, Prasanna Um It's a pleasure to come and speak to you on French uh, experiment. Uh, then, uh, of course, we built satellites, and this satellite is Adipata, the first satellite that we built indigenously, flown from Russia. This was in 1975. Uh, and uh, today, if you go to Trivandrum, typically you see this sort of crowd uh, on the days when the sounding rockets are actually launched, so that the, the Tumba rocket launching program continues. And uh, clearly, the uh, program for this was actually set up by uh, two major visionaries, Vikram uh, Sarabhai and uh, Holy Baba, uh, great friends. And I think they uh, colluded, collaborated in many aspects uh, that has actually impacted uh, Indian science and technology for years ago. Uh, but certainly, the drive uh, and the focus of which uh, the two really established the space program, defining its fundamental approach of need to really look at resource mapping as a very key area for Indian space, while the country was still at the early phase of its growth and development, has actually led to what is today ISRO. Um, so the six decades of ISRO, if you look at it, uh, began with the uh, 63 Sambi rocket. And then in 75, we had the opportunity to do it. We're still building rockets at that time. Our rockets were not yet ready. And uh, but then with a series of other satellites using Indian rockets, we had a source a series of satellites. And one of the important things from a space science point of view was one of this was a time when gamma ray bursts were um, very mysterious. They're mysterious even today, but they're much more mysterious than being over was in the galaxy in the edge of the universe. And we didn't know where it came from. So you had to use triangulation techniques to actually locate them. And SROS too carried these um, sodium iodide uh, gamma ray detectors that actually were used as part of the triangulation process to locate gamma ray bursts. And then optical astronomers would have spent years trying to come map out the error box because it's such a large error box in this sense. But gamma ray bursts have moved quite a bit since then. In 96, we had an opportunity to fly. Uh, X-ray experiments on a, on a remote sensing satellite. By that time, remember the focus was remote sensing. So because of remote sensing uh, was a major requirement of the country. So whenever you have opportunities to use that platform to do science experiments, it's so permitted that. And uh, Professor P.C. Agarwal from KFR with the team was told, okay, you have nine months to deliver uh, a payload. They did it in nine months. They did put it together along with the group at the, at the Israel Satellite Center. Uh, so that was a sort of the IXAE experiment, which was primarily proportional counters looking at uh, extra binaries, trying to look at timing and spectroscopy. Um, but the, it is critical because it is that experiment that showed that the community in India is actually mature enough to really build which uh, serious science experiments. And then Professor, Professor Agarwal, Professor uh, Kamishwar Rao, etc., joined hands to really argue for a major Indian astronomy satellite, which became AstroSat. Many years of discussion and uh, nearly 20 years of development. And in 2015, we flew AstroSat, which continues to fly today. Uh, but prior to AstroSat, we had opportunities also around the same time. Uh, the moon was a topic of great interest, and uh, planet exploration was something that uh, was uh, felt by uh, both academics as well as uh, uh, technocrats, and so that is worthwhile for us to do. So the first lunar mission, Chandrayaan 1, uh, which also had 
And it was a very collaborative experiment. It's very, very interesting that at that stage, in, sometime in 2003 or so, it was decided that we'd open up uh, opportunities for global partners to participate in the Chandrayaan 1 mission. So, papers from other countries where, where proposals uh, on that were solicited, and uh, six papers were actually adopted from other countries. And then, together, along with the experiments from India, it was flown in 2008. So, in 2004, is when we had that other meeting in Udaipur. Um, so, that was in 2009, in 2008. And that was important because it is, in many ways, one of the modern um, space science history for India. This is actually the first mission that actually set the ball rolling with regard to uh, science as a major program and, a, and an observatory of that class. Uh, then we had a mission to Mars, Mangalyan, Mars Orbiter mission, which was actually primarily a technology mission and it did carry five experiments on board, but the focus was you know, getting into Mars is no joke, uh, getting injected into it, etc. Was, uh, was a major concern. So it was done fairly rapidly. And so the, uh, the technology focus was the primary uh, focus of the mission uh, and the experiments uh, which carried uh, color cameras and a few other things and discuss a few, in a few minutes, uh, continued until very recently the mission was actually terminated recently. Uh, we then had the AstroSat launch, which I talked about. And then in 2019, it was a Chandrayaan 2. It was a very large program. It took 10 years for us to really get from Chandrayaan 1 to 2, because now this involved not only an orbiter, it also had a lander, as well as a rover program. And as many of you know, we were not really successful with the landing um, program of uh, Chandrayaan 2, and which is going to be repeated with uh, or, or uh, retried with the Chandrayaan 3 uh, later this year. And then uh, we have, of course, some of the future plans. So in yellow are the two missions that are currently, science missions that are currently in orbit, and these are the future programs that uh, I'll discuss. In the so the Mars Orbiter mission, as I mentioned earlier, was primarily a a technology demonstration mission, and the uh, key was to really make sure we can insert it into the orbit. We had to really worry about deep space communication. We haven't gone this far. Uh, autonomy was critical. You know, it takes time for night to travel between for a command to go from here to there. And so you can't wait for uh, feedback from the housekeeping saying that yes, the temperature or that the voltage has gone to this level before we issue the next command. So it had to be built on board. So autonomous features were incorporated. So those technologies are all worked out. Scientifically, there was also clearly objectives in looking at features. It didn't carry a very large camera. So it was primarily an off the shelf camera, color camera that actually had. Uh, it was used to look at Mars in total. Many a time, when you go to as things advance, as it happens even with uh, regular astronomy missions, where you get so sensitive, they can no longer look at bright objects. And so it's similarly imaging processes. People have cameras with high, very high resolution, but small footprints. So you can never get Mars as a total. And this camera actually gives you pictures of Mars in totality. And that was used. And then it had a few other experiments, uh, primarily look at methane. Methane was at uh, that time seen as an interesting signature. There was an evidence for methane detection, but uh, we were not able to uh, confirm it. And then we had uh, uh, you know, a, an infrared camera that was actually used to look at the, uh, the near infrared imagery from, the moon, from, from Mars. Uh, so it completed seven years, and uh, uh, early this year, while we had a little fewer left, and uh, it lost, uh, it was difficult to control it. It was a six month mission, but lasted long enough. And this sort of uh, broad pictures are available. And there was a particular, a big uh, uh, dust storm that was seen during uh, the mission phase that was interesting for which interesting results have come regarding how uh, atmosphere escape can actually happen from dust storms. AstroSat uh, is, a, is an uh, running satellite, very successful, Saturn ES Plus. And uh, had uh, uh, has five experiments on board. This is the picture of the satellite before launch in the clean room in Bangalore, uh, 2015 launch. It was launched in the circular orbit, and uh, particular, unlike other ISRO missions, where you often have for remote sensing, you use a sun synchronous orbit, an orbit where the sun uh, and the orbit plane makes a, a fixed angle. And so that when you image Earth, you always image at continuous, at fixed uh, solar illumination conditions, which makes it easy to compare day to day images, etc. However, that particular sun synchronous orbit, which has the uh, polar orbit, has problems of high background 
uh, which affects uh, detectors. And so when you're trying to do astronomy, you really like to do it in a low orbit, in particular X-ray instruments. So AstroSat was specifically the scientists requested a very low inclination orbit, six degree inclination. And so that was achieved with AstroSat. And that has enabled us to really have much longer duty cycle of operation of the X-ray instruments. Um, it had uh, many experiments on board, and there'll be a big a detailed talk I understand later uh, that we'll discuss this. But in terms of targets, you have, uh, uh, I mean, I put solar system brackets because we still try to do the solar system. And this comes back to the point I mentioned earlier, uh, many objects in the solar system are too bright for our ultraviolet telescope to look at. But for example, we like to look at the moon. Uh, with the soft X-ray telescope, but you have to make sure that the UV instrument is not affected and that we can track uh, something that's moving so fast, unlike our regular uh, tracking of astrophysical sources. But uh, clearly, there have been in, uh, observed interesting results and on from exoplanets to stars to binary systems. A lot of the X-ray uh, data looked at the galactic uh, plane, a lot of X-ray binaries, microquasars, star clusters, Milky Way, as a specific focus. And of course, the Magellanic system has been an uh, area of great interest. And then we start forming an active galaxies, clusters, transients, and so on. Um, so I won't say much more about it other than to say that it clearly uh, demonstrated the, the UV instrument that if this institute was involved in, in delivering, clearly showed that it can actually produce very high resolution images, large field, high resolution images. Today, the best of it comes from this instrument on AstroSight. Uh, and those results I hope will be presented elsewhere. In terms of user community, this is one of the rare cases we have a very large user community. We have 30 religious from France and uh, large numbers from the US and Italy. Uh, and, but there is an open call for proposals. There is a review every year. I forgot end cycle of AO now, but there's been many. And the data are all accessible from the data center that we have in Bangalore, the Indian Space Science Data Center. And uh, we have regular uh, uh, meetings that actually are uh, enabled to allow uh, the young researchers from universities, institutes, et cetera, to come and actually present their papers. Uh, so that's a satisfying part of this whole program. Let me move to the planetary exploration program. Uh, this is the, this is program two. Um, the satellite and that is the lander and the uh, rover inside that nature together is a very large satellite you can see a person standing next to it so maybe one of the tallest we have actually uh, taken up so the, this is just before launch at the Shurikota. is the ferry of the rocket in which they make sure all is well and uh, its focus had uh, primarily three thematic areas uh, water and moon now water in Chandrayaan one we were fortunate to have a uh, experiment that actually could de demonstrate the presence of water on the moon, not just uh, in one location, but globally present. And uh, it was important to uh, uh, focus on that a bit more because the moon is no longer, water on the moon is no longer just for science with regard to origin and evolution of the moon, but also for potential human return and as a potential launching platform for future missions that go to Mars and other places. Water is critical. So you need to look for surface water. And so we had an infrared spectroscopy instrument that actually looks at in the near infrared, about one to four, three microns. And at close to three microns, there is an absorption feature that is characteristic of water. And that is the water is used in Chandrayaan one. However, because it involves also corrections to thermal component that will come into the same band, and that subtraction was uh, challenged at some level, there was a need to really go to broader energy bands up to five microns independently derive the thermal component from that, and then do the subtraction, and then demonstrate that the water signal is indeed there. And that is what was done by the, with the with IR spectroscope, spectroscopy instrument called IIRS, was launched and extended the water signature, uh, the spectroscopic signature down, capability down to five microns. We also had um, synthetic aperture radars, which are very good to really probe subsurface, because you know at S-band at 1.4 and 2.5 gigahertz, these, Frequencies can actually penetrate a few meters, and you can the reflection from the return signal uh, that the SAR sees tells you much more about uh, potential uh, water uh, present in these places. Of course, uh, surface roughness can also provide backscatter. So you really need to look at it from a polarimetric perspective. And so we have launched uh, in this mission a SAR that had both L and S band. And I think the L band is for the first time flown on it. 
having multiple frequencies allows you to actually remove some of the degeneracies that exist uh, with a single frequency observation, which has been the past experience with uh, Chandrayaan 1, with LRO, etc. They had uh, uh, some frequency experiments. Uh, we also had in the exosphere of Mars, which of, of, of Moon, which is a very thin so, um, um, presence of uh, molecules, you actually have a mass spectrometer, a very sensitive mass spectrometer that can look for, in principle, many molecules, including water, argon, and so on. So that was also there. So water on Moon was addressed by these. Then there's also global mapping. As this is an orbiter mission, it actually maps it. Uh, we look at the mineral composition again for the spectroscopic signatures and absorption features that demonstrate that are characteristic of the combination of minerals. As usual, you can take in the laboratory, you can actually take ILNA and actually illuminate with optical uh, light and then look at the infrared spectrum, you get a very clear signature of ILNA. But when you have ILNA combined with plagiocrase, feldspar, few other things, you can get a confusing picture. Just as you do astronomy, you come back and ask what is a fractional contribution is, and then that is. Remain a challenge, but uh, we made a substantial improvement of that with this IRS mission. And then you also look at the same element, not in the form of mineral, but the element present in the mineral independently as a chemical signature. You actually ask, can I identify the extra transitions that you actually come from uh, these excitation of these elements? And this could be magnesium, aluminum, silicon, sulfur, calcium, titanium, iron, and so on. But to eliminate it, you will need an extra source, and you don't have an extra source with you that can be operated operate from a 100 kilometer orbit. So you use the natural extra source, and that is the sun. The corona of the sun is sufficiently bright, and during a flare, it gives you the extra light that you're looking for. So whenever there's a flare, you look at the reflectance, extra uh, fluorescence line coming from the surface, and that is the class experiment. Um, and so it combines that with the solar X-ray monitor, which has been used independently to do interesting solar science with regard to solar flares, uh, the first ionization potential effects that you see in coronal abundance, and so on. You also look at the SAR is also used for so the uh, thickness of these regular topography with the imaging cameras. We have a, a stereoscopic uh, camera, uh, as well as a very high resolution camera. Then you also have, you also use the the transmission, the orbital the spacecraft uh, communication channel, as it comes to Earth, as it graces the edge of the planet, we can actually learn things about uh, uh, any ionized, you know, ionized uh, content in, in the environment around the planet, in this case, the moon. It was also an attempt to do localized mapping, because remember we had a lander and a rover that was meant to do localized mapping of the landing location and maybe a little bit of where uh, roves that included properties of the regulate in terms of conductivity of the thermal, thermal conductivity of the location, uh, and plasma environment that we had in land approach, uh, and uh, something that actually looks at the alpha particle spectroscopy that actually can be compositional information. We also carry something called LIPS, it's a laser, what is that, laser induced ablation spectroscopy. And what is done is you basically shine a laser and they allow the surface of that material to actually um, become a plasma. And then you look at the spectral signature of that. And that is also what's carried on it. And of course, there's a seismometer. Unfortunately, as of now, this is not complete because of the um, incompleteness of the Chandrayaan 2 mission. And we hope to have that uh, addressed in Chandrayaan 3. So it's, uh, it's a simple 100 kilometer orbit. And we just uh, just mentioned these uh, experiments that are on board. Here are some images. Uh, maybe it's difficult to see, but you can actually see small boulders. This is coming from a camera called OHRC. It's actually a very high resolution camera. It has a resolution pixel, uh, you know, of twenty five meter res centimeter resolution. It's sharper than what is even there on the NASA's uh, LRO mission. So we've been actually providing data using this camera for future landing programs. Japanese wanted the landing uh, imagery of their landing location we provided that. Very soon we may have been providing that for the Artemis mission that's actually landed in the woods. So, <clears throat> but it's very good to really see very small features in terms of small crater cones, small boulders in terms of, uh, and you can if you look carefully, you see the shadow uh, from the grazing incidence of the sun. Uh, so illumination is critical in looking at optical imagery. But this is a very small footprint, so you can't use it to map the whole moon, and it's, it demands large data volume. So 
you can't operate it all the time. So a real challenge on Chandrayaan 2 is to really figure out which ones to operate when, and given the power condition, given the data download scenario. So it's a tricky thing for the mission to be done. Uh, the other camera, which is a terrain mapping camera, which, as I said, has three triple cameras, four nadir and aft. So you take from three different directions, and the same spot is looked at from three different angles. So you can make your digital elevation models, and that is used to be needed for interesting terrain. And this is supposed to do the full mapping, and so I think we're almost uh, at the end of finishing that. These are some individual images, uh, very uh, uh, resolutions that are, uh, and you know, when you look at optical images, you often find that some elevation makes a big difference to what you see. Each and so many a time, the same uh, target is actually captured in different sun elevations. Now, the evidence from lunar water, as I mentioned, this is the data from the Chandrayaan One NQ mission, which showed a large presence of water from poles to pole to pole. <laughs> the synthetic aperture radar on that, which was only an S band, showed presence of uh, water, but then this question is because of single S band radar. And uh, there was also the, the, the lunar um, the LRO mission, reconnaissance orbiter that's still orbiting the moon. Uh, they were able to see glint from the uh, from what appeared to be the reflecting frozen ice surfaces, both from the laser as well as they have an onboard laser that is used as a as a as a measure to do laser ranging. Uh, and there was also so they could look at this data and actually show that there is frozen water uh, at the poles, and that is also another indication for even landing the poles because that's the, the source of water in the pole is critical. And the pole is important for moon because uh, in other parts of the uh, other latitudes, you know, mid latitudes and, and non polar regions, what happens is you have a 14 day winter, 14 day, sorry, night. And this night is very cold, super cold, 100 degrees Kelvin. And you really have a hard time trying to really manage instruments going from 330 to 100 degrees. But you have the poles, what happens is because of the sheer grazing incidence and the orientation of the moon, not as tilted as much as Earth, you actually have some locations, some, some small mountain tops where sun is there most of the time. And these are called islands of eternal light, you know, very nice name, but it's really critical when you're actually going there, where the temperature is manageable. And so there's a lot of interest in the poles. And then in addition, if this is there's present of water in these, in these craters, that's very important. And from an astrophysical and uh, from a from a from a science perspective, it's also important to ask this question: Is this water really primordial water? Is it water from the early solar system formation? Is it secondary water? What are the original? There are theories that say much of the water escaped from comets and actually from Earth's the new class of water. But where do we sample it? This is a place to go sample it. So these permanently shadowed regions, there are craters that are permanently shadowed, never seen sunlight. You can imagine these are fantastic places to go and observe. Look for this sample is early water, and it's not far. We can actually bring that back to Earth for very detailed studies. So, so this absorption feature is what I was saying. There is this uh, in IR close to three microns. You see, it, depending on whether it's ice, whether it's some other form of water ice, OH, you can get slightly different spectral features. So it's been a concern. So, and uh, we had a mass spectrometer on board in Chandrayaan one, which said we found water. We took some time to talk about it because mass spectrometers are not easy to look for. You know, if the water shows up as one of these peaks, you can't read from here, but uh, uh, there is an AMU is the right axis, uh, the x axis, and at the, at, the, at the point where you expect the uh, AMU for water, you actually see it. H2O was actually seen. But any mass spectrometer going to work is always this worry that it is out gases. Can it be out gases? Taken from the other gun. Precisely. So that concern was there. So we had to really, and we had only a one shot because this mass spectrometer was on a on a on a module that was released from Chandrayaan one and was ballistically crash landing on the pole, southern pole, south pole. So you had one orbit to really do it. It was not enough to do it. So there were all these hints, and so with that in mind, it was decided that we'll extend the uh, in the next mission. We'll extend the spectroscopic capability to five microns. And then try to use the fact that we have thermal data, thermal spectrum available there to really do the proper subtraction. So, with that in mind, uh, we have done this, and we can actually see this feature uh, emerging very clearly 
from the, 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 the two pillow after the uh, infrared subtraction. And you can see that signature for water, that absorption feature varies depending on the location that we have. So right now, they are working out the mapping of the strength of this line across the uh, surface of the moon at different seasons and of different illumination conditions as well. This, the synthetic aperture radar, as I mentioned, can look below. And if you look down the left, what you see is the synthetic, synthetic aperture radar imagery for one part of the moon. And what you see in this colored thing is, is um, high reflectors. And what you can actually see is that these are craters, but around the crater also you see a lot of reflectors. And what it suggests is, is the presence of excess roughness, for example. Here is in the, if you look at this particular one too, you see a lot of uh, ejecta in this direction, you know, almost as though you can know the direction from which the projectile came and hit it. But it's covered up by regolith. Regolith is this constant plummeting when uh, the moon surface is being bombarded with microwave rise at a very high rate daily, continuously. What it does is it actually produces this churning of material and things get covered with this stuff. So if I look at the same location with the LRO images, you don't see these, these structures that you see here. So SAR brings that out very clearly, and this is the kind of thing. But the challenge is to really distinguish it from roughness to actual presence of water, and then quantify it. So those are non-trivial, but a lot of work is going on. Uh, so this is a spectrometer that actually looks for these individual signals, as the signatures of elements, as I said. And uh, I have, uh, we see for the first time, uh, evidences for things like chromium, never really seen earlier, manganese, never seen earlier, and clear, and the advantage of this particular experiment is you can quantify it very precisely. Uh, we calibrate this, for example, in the lab in, in the URC, using known, in some case, unknown elements are given to them. I mean, I remember, I think the RBI was released a 10 rupee coin at that time, where we know precisely his composition. So I, I think I gave it to Atre and told him, I won't tell you what it is, you do it. And we actually found it. So we found the, the decarbonation process. I mean, except for is a very old technique, but what is not done is when you have to do this in a field condition, where you don't have control on the illumination, where you don't have control on the way you prepare the sample, the texture of the sample, the particle size distribution, how to interpret that as a challenge. So, but I think with Chandrayaan 2, they should soon be releasing maps of each of these elements, oxygen map of the moon, aluminum map of the moon, vacation map of the moon. And that's a very important input that goes into asking the question about origin of the moon. Uh, now, coming up uh, very quickly are these three missions this year, Aditya L1, ExpoSat and Chandrayaan 3. Chandrayaan 3, already I mentioned, largely is doing the completeness of what was left from Chandrayaan 2. Aditya L1 is a primarily a, a dedicated solar mission. Um, began initially as a mission around uh, Earth, and then we moved to L1. And uh, with this, with the set of seven experiments on board, trying to look at uh, answer questions about what heats the corona, waves, or any other processes, uh, the, the dynamics of CNEs can we map it very close to the disk of the sun. Um, you know, other details on abundances, nature of how the flares and seam is linked, and so on. So all of these are being addressed using a set of instruments, seven instruments. Some are uh, uh, remote sensing. They are uh, so we have a coronagraph, and this coronagraph is an internal culture coronagraph. Uh, a real challenge to build it. This institution is the lead institution that's actually produces. So they're about almost ready to deliver. It's an absolutely challenging experiment to do. And uh, its uh, uniqueness is the fact that it comes absolutely very, very close to the disk of the sun. 1.05 solar radii is very one strong imaging. Uh, and it's challenging because of the fact that it's scattering from the surface of the primary mirror from where you're going to extract the coronal images is got to be very, very highly controlled. And the control it would mean to have surface drop, surface uh, RMS at an extremely challenging level. And that has been uh, maybe the, the best mirror we've ever made is what is there in our VLC. Uh, we also have a UV imager that looks at the sun up to three solar radii, gives continuous uh, uh, information on its uh, uh, irradi uh, irradiance that is critical for Earth, sun, earth effects and studies, as well as has many filter bands on which you can do other interesting science and two X-ray spectrometers to cover the broad band of a solar flare. 
And then there are in situ experiments. They experiment and actually measure particles, particles in this direction, from electrons and protons and these alpha particles, uh, as well as a magnetometer that actually are critical to really combine them to really address uh, local uh, dynamics that actually happen with the solar wind. Uh, so this is the VLC imaging part of it. And then uh, the spectra is up to 1.5 solar radii. And uh, uh, so the and UV, uh, the, the UV emitter also goes to three solar radii. And that is a, uh, that really addresses this whole idea of what is the corona. And combining that with the uh, X-ray spectrum that gives you contextual information on the nature of that particular flare covering both soft X-rays and hard X-rays. Uh, I mean, this hard X-ray one is not as uh, comparable as RESI. RESI can also be imaging, but the idea is contextually, we actually get both these things in one go. And in particles, you're really looking at uh, AEV to MEV particles, electrons, uh, uh, protons, and ions, uh, primarily alpha particles. And in particular, in a CAV particles, by ion, this ratio of protons to uh, alpha particles is a good indicator of the presence of the CAV. And so that has been maximized with this experiment. And the magnetometer, as I mentioned earlier. So uniqueness of Aditya <coughs> is uh, dynamics close to the disk. I mean, as a, as a real, real challenge. I mean, I mean even at 1.1, which many have managed to do, but going to 1.0 is not easy. Uh, and then uh, issues about, you know, it also carries a spectrocolorimetric package, very challenging things to do. You're moving the slits by a millimeter at uh, 10 micron steps non-trivial for a space experiment. Um, spatial resolved disk observations in the near UV, onboard intelligence is part of that, and observations we discuss around here. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that these space observations will be complemented by ground. <laughs> Dari Vidanova is a very important facility. It actually provides uh, uh, megahertz uh, imaging, uh, very critical for various kinds of solar activity, and I think IA has this unique facility. GMRT has a capability to do solar uh, complement many of these uh, activities. And the Utu Radio Telescope, in terms of simple interplanetary scintillation, which of course, Professor Manohar has been all doing that for many years, but now it's not clear. So someone needs to take it up and it up by a scheme to help. And then you have the HRFA Telescope at Merak, HRFA Kodai, and uh, the Ecosolar sort of Observatory, Aries, all these things again, and also um, magnetic laboratories at Alipa. Quite. So it's while it doesn't come cover the complete spectrum, it makes an effort to really cover a fair amount of it. But it raises unique, important unique questions for the community with regard to what do you want to do after this? After you know, Aditya one is about to go, it's time to start thinking about what next. Now, later this year, we again have a polarimetric mission. This has been uh, uh, is a small satellite mission is the way we started. It's still a small satellite. There's two experiments on board, an extra polarimeter. Polarimetry, as you know, has been, uh, extra polarimetry was done some 40 years ago. Then they stopped, they measured uh, spot polarization. And for whatever reason, nothing emerged until very recently. IXP, which both Europe and the US are involved in, which actually showed very, very interesting results. Uh, we are, our plans were to have this launch well before that, and this is a little less sensitive compared to IXP. But uh, we also added a spectrometer that complements this, and uh, it's a soft X ray spectrometer, actually a duplicate of the class experiment, but uh, slightly reconfigured uh, because it allows you to give, you know, polarization is a very weak signal. So you have to stare at the source for not for a few hours as you do in UV and optical, but not days, but sometimes a month. Now, uh, when you have to stay at for a month, it really helps to really have other complementary experiments that also stays at for a month. So you can actually study continuous spectral behavior of, we say, an extra binary with regard to the dynamics that actually happens around black holes and so on. So expect as experiments, of course, we do that. This has to be in a circular orbit. It has to be rotating because a polarimeter could have modulations that are actually intrinsic to the instrument. So one way to really avoid that is to rotate about the, uh, its uh, roll axis. So that has to be done. But then when it's rotating in a certain scenario, it's uh, the optimizing it for solar power becomes critical. So when it's sun facing, you stop the rotation. You charge up the batteries. Go behind the earth, it starts observing. 
you speed it up. Every organ, every 90 minutes you do this, it is an absolute challenge. But then we have to do it. It's really difficult. Um, this is uh, from Raman Research Institute. This should be called as a pre this experiment, and it provides an engine in 8 to 30 keV. And then low energy is 8 because of the fact that it uses a scatterer. It basically uses the fact that you actually you allow scattering. And when it's a polarized photon, the scatter play is actually defined. And so you use four detectors around it and, and map out the azimuthal distribution of scatter as a way of measuring the polarization. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, science interest goes from primary binaries, uh, pulsars, and uh, many other galactic sources. Uh, we believe it will be difficult to really do much extragalactic science with this, given the sensitivity we have here. And if you look at IXPE in conjunction with ExpoSat, uh, Polix uh, ExpoSat covers this part of the spectrum. Uh, there's the hard X ray. This is the other area that, uh, sorry, IXPE, there's a very soft part, two to eight, and then this picks up from eight to 10. So we're hoping uh, with the launch this year sometime, we maybe have some common targets that are bright enough for Polix that could be observed in Polix. It's fair, well, that would be a very useful thing to do. Because, uh, you know, many a time, the results that we now see with IXPE. Uh, would show polarization behavior different, for example, how it modulates with uh, the phase of the pulse star, like the crack pulse star. There are data actually from, um, from CZTI and Astrosat that actually show something else, but that's at very high energies. You need to know whether it is really an artifact of the data, the analyzed data, or it's really the fact that it's energy dependent uh, dramatic variation in the polarization fraction. And that is the kind of bridging that Polix is expected to do. Uh, I mentioned expect is very similar, similar instrument, just broken into two parts for computation on the instrument, on the spacecraft. Now, last few minutes, let me just talk about the UV, uh, uh, the future space programs. Uh, clearly, Astrosat has been a game changer with regard to demonstrating the national capability to really put together a large scale observatory, multi wavelengths, operate it, uh, involve. Uh, uh, community in the form of seeking proposals and regulators, those evaluating, scheduling, and getting the data public, and the process continues. And we want to build on that. And to build on that, we need to ask where do we go? The UE instrument that was built here was an absolutely exceptional instrument. And uh, there is a lot of interest uh, to look at spectroscopy. So there is a, a team here led by uh, Professor Andrew and team that is looking at spectroscopic expansion of this capability. Uh, with high, including high resolution UV imaging. So that's a, a serious proposal under consideration. We hope this year we will have a chance to put that into a phase A program. Uh, exoplanets, uh, they, you know, everybody wants to do exoplanets, and we also want to do exoplanets. There was a large, uh, ambitious uh, proposal that was actually circulated sometime back. I think uh, uh, there has been quest space of study, they felt they were trying to accommodate a large two meter class mission into our own rockets and to have it launched, but that study continues. Uh, it's not going to be an easy mission. Uh, you need photometric accuracies that are very large, you need stabilizations of uh, various issues, etc. But clearly, exoplanet studies are very important and we need to take it up. I think the community will have to really work on that to really emerge with a very strong proposal that can be taken up for consideration. And uh, with the discovery of gravitational waves and uh, the realization that LIGO, the two LIGO labs, and now Virgo still has an error box, is still large, large for looking for counterparts. You know, if you want to do optical searches for counterparts and quick follow up, you really need something else that can provide that. So there's been a proposal from led by IIT Bombay to really look at the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational wave merger events, particularly neutron and neutron swan events. And so this involves uh, technology is not very really complex, but it still involves producing large number of sensors on two satellites to cover the full sky. And so that is also has been, as these are all experiments that have been partially selected and funded uh, in the initial phase of it. But the next phase, we have to see how much uh, progress we have and how much of uh, uh, just today to bring in regarding the timing of that in the context of the science relevance. You know, something like this is particularly important. I think the G EM counterpart, a lot of people in the world are working on this issue. And we need to be sure that by the time we have it up there, these error boxes are indeed of, of real relevance. There's also an interesting uh, interest and in proposal submitted around low frequency radio emission. Primarily looking at the 21 centimeter redshifted uh, EOR signal, which has been 
uh, claim at uh, 80 megahertz or so, uh, which now the recent results from the RRI uh, experiment called uh, Cyrus. 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 Uh, and that's a, you know there are many ways in which you can actually create such a signature, but it's an important thing. So, uh, but the challenge to many of these such very sensitive radio instruments is the other high the radio frequency interference that happens on orbits around Earth. So, what they would really like is to go to the far side of the moon uh, in an orbit, in a lunar orbiter and observe uh, this when it's on the other side of the moon. Now, we can't have a separate mission just for that, so we have to see how to accommodate it. We actually tried very hard to accommodate this in Chandrayaan 3, you know, and, and two months of intense work at the time, it was too big to really have it to put it in that. Because uh, you really need to have a ground plane for that, and antenna system, it wasn't easy to do. So these are possible experiments, and the extra astronomy, uh, again, has to build on what Astros had there, and there is interest for broadband polarization across planets, but I think. Um, the discussion in the community continues every few months. There's a meeting, and I think this convergence still hasn't happened. So, that's a possible opportunity for potential collaborative activities with the European colleagues. Uh, we, on the planetary side, we have a plans to go to Venus, and the Venus was actually an interesting object, uh, planet to go to uh, for various reasons. Uh, it's uh, certainly the atmosphere, uh, topography is not very well known because of fully covered with clouds. We use radar to see the surface. And of course, uh, you know, behaviors of you know, you know, very high the whole the, the atmosphere at about 100 kilometers travels, uh, circum goes around the planet every four days when the planet itself is going very very slow. And of course, there are these interesting issues and uh, Venus acts as a as a target for asking the question about a planet which is in a habitable zone, very similar to what Earth is. How did it transform into something completely different? Are there lessons? Are there really useful inputs that we can learn regarding planets, exoplanet studies, and habitability questions, which are now uh, uh, things of prime importance globally? Uh, so, I think about in 2012 or so, we had actually put together a, uh, the first meeting that we call the, the community interested in India to put together a proposal for Venus. And then, about uh, right now, we're just waiting for formal approval. We need money, I suppose. And um, to get priority, so we're waiting. Otherwise, uh, all set to go. It was originally scheduled for a 23 launch uh, because of unique opportunities. You know, the opportunity for Venus come there be uh, roughly about 19 months or so. And uh, lift off uh, mass is critical. So you really, so right now, a 31 window is good, it's very good. I mean, so Europe is going in 31, Americans are going in 31. Um, for China, I might go any time, 26, 27, whenever they want to go. Uh, but uh, there is a big onslaught of uh, a large set of uh, missions to be targeted from Venus. We hope we will have an opportunity to really, uh, go there as well. Um, so in terms of all of these, uh, what do we have? Uh, challenges and challenges is as a, as, a, as a space program, a space science program, we need to have a challenge of building a strong user community. And that's very critical. I mean, today we have Core users, okay, we we'll get into the nitty gritty, but that's all right. They say those who are giving us money and say that's not enough. We need more. So a much greater effort, as we're now doing with with you know, reaching out to schools and colleges, students, having a large student involvement in in these research programs. I mean, I really think we have missed out on that. We really need, I would say, ten times what we now have without student involvement in programs. Um, in uh, PhD level astronomy uh, and space science missions. Uh, broader involvement is critical in the pre launch activities. And I say pre launch because of the fact that we do have a fair number of people, as you saw in the AstroSat case, we use the data after it's made available, after it's processed. We also want people to get involved further. I mean, your real appreciation of data when it comes in, you can actually see and get to get to know what's involved, what's involved, how did the calibration go, what's uncertainty in this calibration, what are the kind of things you need to worry about. And it also allows us to build something faster, quicker. And uh, in that context, looking for small scale activity where you can participate, as you now do with, you know, I think the, the, the large ground based instruments, TMT, etc., have learned how to do that, of really creating global activities, break the problem down into smaller units, and people take up and then we need to do that with the space mission as well. 
And of course, international collaborations. We're not going to be exploited that fully, done a bit, but then no, we will we, we'll have to exploit. So my final slide, I just want to really talk about the Indo-French connections. And uh, um, it's a short list and I say incomplete because I'm sure we missed some things. But the collaboration with France has been uh, always a very unique one. I think it's one with a lot of trust. Uh, and uh, it began with the early phase. As I told you, the first uh, um, sounding rocket had uh, French experiments on board. The Picasso engine that we use quite extensively had a lot of collaborative help from uh, France. On Chandrayaan 1, um, the HEX experiment, I was the PI of the HEX experiment, high, high energy X-ray spectrometer experiment, we're trying to do this very rapidly. So I was in you know, Paris for that uh, meeting. At Toulouse, we had uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Olivia Gannon and others who really wanted to work with us, but our time schedule was too tight for them. But then you did work with them on modeling the data, and that has gone on. In, uh, I have not highlighted this, but I just want to really emphasize the fact that there's not a collaboration, but there is a, the laser uh, uh, ablation spe uh, breakdown spectroscopy instrument that we now fly in Chandrayaan 2 was actually triggered by when Silvestre Maurice uh, came uh, as part of the Chandrayaan 1 discussions uh, to Israel. He gave a talk about uh, his uh, experiment that was used on Mars on the, on the Curiosity rover. It was actually Zaps the rocks and you actually get details. And they, they thought it was fascinating. And then uh, I think the colleagues decided to build one for the moon. That was the first one for the moon. And the joint missions that we have had, the successful mission of Megatropics, which was actually a very successful mission, uh, and then Saral, which is actually something you look at ocean circulation, are also important missions that shows the strength of the Indo French program. And in the AO, the Announcement Opportunity for Venus Mission, which was also open in 2018, we allowed the globe to participate. Uh, we had a we have a proposal that is a joint, uh, well, initially, yeah, it's a Russian uh, French program. Uh, and uh, now that we um, since we don't have clarity on our um, our program for Venus is not yet fully approved, uh, we will await that and we hope we will have chances to collaborate with our colleagues in France. And on future possibilities, these are my own personal views on it, and that is because, you know, the wide field monitor, X-ray monitor, I mean, X-ray, uh, today our SXT has a half a degree field of view. Uh, transient astronomy is everywhere, you know, with uh, LSST and many others, and uh, ZTF, etc. We're constantly looking at most of the sky all the time, as much as we can. X-ray astronomy needs to do that as well. One way to use wide field monitors, and wide field monitors, uh, with spectroscopic capability, and that can is possible lobster eye. And there are experiments, the, the, the Chinese lobster eye experiment recently showed results that are quite interesting. I never thought with that kind of optics you can do extended sources, but you can actually do that. So there is interest in the country as well, and there are uh, certainly uh, companies in France, and if you can connect that with the colleagues who may be interested in that. Now, they're looking at optics, for example, and that we supply, we can do the rest of it, we can have a joint mission. Uh, but we haven't had any discussion with anybody. I'm just looking at something. And also on the balloon. So now Venus is a very important uh, place to do both orbiter as well as an atmospheric probe. Venus atmosphere is very interesting. At 70 kilometers above the surface, Venus atmosphere is fairly benign. At the surface, it is 90, 90, bar, 90 times the pressure here. It's 700 degrees centigrade, centigrade Kelvin. Extremely difficult to survive. But at 70 degrees, things are fairly benign. You can actually live there if you want to. There could be microbes up there, who knows? You like to have sample of the day, ideally. So there is a NASA mission to bring it back. I tried to get some people to think about it here. It's too challenging right now. But the idea of a balloon experiment is something we've been thinking about. And so depending on the timing of our mission, that balloon opportunity may arise. And uh, we've had colleagues in France who have expressed an interest in actually um, participating in the balloon experiment. So there are many possibilities and many more. I think meetings like this will certainly bring them out. So let me close with this picture of uh, uh, Jacques Laveau, who was actually very, very critical in actually helping us in many of our space experiments, right from the Descartes engine. He was a great friend of Professor URL. Uh, he had multiple times come here to discuss uh, Venus as a, uh, Venus ballooning as a target, and numerous. And so here he is receiving Padma Shri from our president. And uh, I think two years ago he passed. But uh, absolutely someone that we think a lot of respect and love for. Let me stop there. Thank you.
It's a very comprehensive uh, talk on astronomy and planetary emissions, and also bring the window frame to the application. So, so those are questions. So, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So, I think the talk covered a lot about the big missions. But are there uh, uh, plans or uh, calls for very small side missions for uh, giving opportunities to many researchers uh, across Indian universities and institutes? Along with these small, these big missions are separate, but small satellites, uh, small right. missions. So, so, what are uh, right. the perspective of those? Right. Quick question. I think in 2004 or so, we had a call for small satellite. Aditya and Expos had a both considered small satellite. It is initially proposed as a small satellite program. It has grown into bigger missions. But what you said is right. We have not exploited the small satellite capability to do real science. There have been inhibitions at some level because of the fact that typically a small satellite doesn't give you precise pointing, stability, control. Um, but I think the world has demonstrated can actually do that. We also have a new platform called the INS uh, nano satellite platform that can actually do that. And so two or three have been flown. Uh, I think uh, what is not has not happened is maybe an open call for small satellite programs. I think the science office is actually looking into that right now for heliophysics and the future beyond Aditya that has been discussed in the inner group with regard to are there things we can do uh, from a small satellite platform, from a cube satellite platform, where you focus on small experiments that can be done very quickly for space weather, a very important thing. So I think as a community, we have to think, so I assume tomorrow the, uh, the call comes in, but how do you prepare for it? We may not be prepared for it. We need to be prepared for it. So I agree, we both sides have to work on it. I'm sure it will come very soon, but it is certainly the solely missing point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, so there's one big uh, actually move going on in the world, and that's called as SGAC Europe. Oh. And actually, uh, very recently, that's after the COVID time, uh, many uh, space agencies have come together and they are carrying out a big uh, campaign of training people in using satellite data for all sorts of projects, development, research, training, uh, from school level up to experienced uh, researchers. So I was wondering if this is a part of it, it is called as SGAC. I'm not aware of this, I'm not going to try it for the last <laughs> three years, so I can't be sure. I haven't heard of it. I mean, yes. we are involved in many other global discussions on on, on moon related thing, on yes. other discussions, I've heard this in particular. I'll check with it. Yes, because yeah. I think this could but be. But it's primarily for training yeah, on really space a, data. Yeah, exactly. And really to a big, uh, big uh, yeah. population of different. Is it, uh, is, it, is it sort of driven by ESA? Or is, is it independent agencies? Of no, there is NS into it, there is EAS into it, so ESA yeah. is into it. And uh, I think there are also American uh, 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 industries into it, NASA is into it. So they are private, they are government. So everyone's there. So I was wondering what is this big move going on? Right, and right, so this right, is why right. I invited you for this right, meeting. Right, yeah. And I was wondering if India would be also interested. You have to know the details. Not only know the details, but participate as well. No, no, no. Yeah. That decision is yeah. on the basis of details. Yeah. Why will you explore? Find out what you uh, say. I'll send it. Uh, sure. Yeah. The entire chemical composition of the moon, Graham Chandra and one is published. No, uh, first of all, that chemistry is only known for the surface of the moon. Then, but the ten micron surface is only really sandy. That is not yet published. Now that's this year. I hope that was only come out because it's laws. These things have these are cores because they're, they're, that X-ray spectroscopy mission has a footprint and the pixel size of about 12 kilometers at best. And the sun is very bright. The sun is not so bright, it becomes 100 kilometers. So you really keep doing this as now that the moon flares, 
they did when you fill the surface of the moon with flare time data. It's high. So it should, it's almost there. So what were the main science objectives for Mars orbital mission? As I said, it's primarily it was a technology mission. And the only the two key things that they were looking for was one was uh, uh, looking at uh, the signature of Vite. That was, uh, you know, from a ground observatory, it's a thing to see. Even now, with curiosity, there are conflicts with episodic. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. So this was uh, when the time that mission was being considered. So we had a um, uh, fabric protocol system there to really look at this thing. And, uh, that, you know, finally we couldn't do it because of some calibration issues, but uh, uh, we, it was a pain signal anyway. And it had to be, the whole payload had to be developed very, very rapidly. So the time, short time scale uh, demanded by the technology window, the Mars was a, every 26 months there is a window to go to Mars. And so that way, that's why it was not a very serious science mission, but it still carried this mission. And it's from those, uh, both the mass spectrometer as that you looked at Arden and its changes with various solar, uh, solar conditions at Mars. So that has actually been uh, published uh, in JGR. There's also this connection between the imagery that you got because it's a um, full format uh, camera looking at the full disk of the moon of, of Mars. Could actually kind of use that to really look at the dust storm evolution and then use other data from other satellites to really link that to loss of uh, atmosphere atmosphere so yeah so it's not a very the next mission has got to be a very very science mission unless of course we are also combining that landing on the moon on mars and it is also challenging something but when the window of uh, development time is short it is difficult for scientists to really come to you know Absolutely cutting edge experiments. Really. So that is the point that we had to really be prepared for uh, opportunities. But then, you know, who drives it? These are all big questions that have to be answered. Yes, yeah. I think I was talking about the space generation advisory council. It's international. ISRO is a part of it. We also have a national point of contact. Uh, in India. Yeah. Okay. So, Who's that? Uh, there's a lady, Megha Chaudhary, and Surender Konal and they are the I will ask the colleagues at Israel. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they are from Israel. I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Question. I have a question about Moon. Like, is there any mission or any study given on the Israel for the farthest side of the Moon? <clears throat> Which is we have not, uh, as of now, uh, we've been focusing more on a polar mission. There's a mission that is being discussed with the Japanese uh, space agency, JAXA, for a polar mission that lands at 89 degrees south latitude uh, and to have a rover that will go into the permanently shadowed crater. So that is completed phase day now. We have, we have to now get a clearance to whether we should go to phase B. So that's it. After that comes, you know, that you know, going to the far side has new challenges, particular having to have another satellite uh, for relay data, commanding data. So, which, uh, the, so the Chinese mission that landed on the other side actually has that uh, satellite positioning on it. It's a much more expensive and involved program to go to the far side. As of Thanks. Yes. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so it's very curious, uh, it's very exciting to see the uh, different experiments coming in covering different frequency bands. But my question is about the sub millimeter and micro frequency bands. So I would like to know the status of CB bar this kind of experiment. So millimeter and micro, yeah. And these are clearly important areas, certainly for astronomy. We think that's very important, maybe for other applications as well. So millimeter has this. Uh, you know, the detectors are not easy to look. So there is a program in the country, in the, this, this application center, there's a team working on a submillimeter ground-based telescope to do carbon monoxide mapping, etc., which we hope will go slowly in the submillimeter mission. Uh, and that's the time when you can actually do it. And ideally, if you had a submillimeter uh, sensor on our Venus mission, that would have been fantastic to look for screen signatures. But that's a challenge. And, uh, uh, right now, so we're only really at the level of laboratory uh, and ground telescope. Hopefully, in the next few years, we'll have that established. 
we need to build from that. So it's a very important idea that uh, we need to move very far out. So just discussing with uh, Devakar Maya, is it here? Okay, Devakar, about the possibility about uh, uh, in Mexico, they have a large sub millimeter, uh, millimeter pay facility. And uh, they have a lot of time. So that's why it's trying to look at the possible trading that time for possible role in future papers. That will allow us to really get used to. So, see what happens often is when we don't have a sub millimeter telescope, we don't do sub millimeter science at all for that. It need not be anymore, true. And we can actually work with it. So, that's why I said, we'll look into it. So, right now we don't have it, but I'm sure it'll come up because they all have very unique ability to look for the important questions that we're all asking. And today, in astronomy, you can see how ALMA is actually producing fantastic results. You can't avoid it, you have to have it. So, we do it. Thank you. Um, Recording uh, stopped. So, um,